We are glad you are with us today. Sean McDowell, I'm here with Bill Dembski. You will recognize him because he is one of the voices and one of the founders, really, of the intelligent design movement with a PhD in mathematics and in philosophy. Many would say he's done the heavy lifting, but has recently uh, entered into some very different ventures. And we want to catch up today and talk about some reflections back on the intelligent design movement, maybe some ways he changed his mind, some things he's learned from it, what he's up to now. But before we start, make sure you hit subscribe because tomorrow we have an interview with Gary Habermas and Michael Kona of a new book they have coming out on the resurrection asking where is the resurrection evidence pointing towards today. So Bill, thanks so much for coming on. Great to be with you, Sean. Great to see you again. Well, let's let's start by asking, I want to hear your journey to faith, because as I understand it, intelligent design or evolution had nothing to do with you first becoming a Christian. Is that right? That is true. My, my dad was uh, actually a uh, biologist who taught evolution at the college level. And, um, you know, I was comfortable with the notion, but it was not uh, something that really uh, either helped or hindered, from what I can see, my my faith journey. I mean, for me, I was, uh, I believed in God, you know, some sort of God, whatever that might be, but it wasn't uh, a Christian God. I mean, I did go to Catholic schools, but that was more just because the, the academics was good. But uh, it was, uh, you know, I had, so I had a sense that there was a, a God, but, uh, you know, who that God was, uh, you know, I, I consciously rejected the doctrine of hell, consciously rejected that God became okay. human in Jesus Christ, you know. And so, uh, so I mean, I, I, was, I was certainly not a Christian doctrinally, but um, it was during a time I had taken a year off from college, was trying to get my head together. Uh, things were not going as well as I would have liked. And I had this sense that God was perfect, and here I was in my imperfection. And how mm. does one make that bridge? You know, how how can we connect with God in a in a real way? Uh, you know, and it wouldn't wasn't going to be enough just you know, well I'm perfect, you know, and hey, I'll you know, just sure. wallow in your your sorrow. Yeah. You know, I needed you know, so the, this this sense of connection. Where could I find it? Huh. And it was at that point that the incarnation. I remember walking on Sheridan Road in uh, Chicago, and it just kind of it hit me, the incarnation. And even this was a doctrine, you know, as I just described, I had consciously rejected, but it was in the incarnation and in God becoming human in Christ and and dying for us that suddenly things made sense, you know, wow. and. Uh, and the thing is, I mean, I had read the Bible, you know, I, I actually liked John's gospel in high school. I was at a Catholic high school. But, you know, when I try to think back, what did I like about it? it it's like, you know, there was just a haze over my mind. Uh, so it's, it's uh, but, you know, when faith, uh, real faith in Christ came, then it seemed that that haze lifted. So how old were you when you became a believer? Roughly. Um, 18 turning 19. Okay, 18 or 19. Yeah. Now, if evolution had nothing to do with you or creation getting into the faith, why, once you became a believer, did you decide to study and commit 25 years <laughs> of your life to this intelligent design movement? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I think, you know, once you enter the faith, uh, then, you know, there's a natural impulse, at least on the part of some, to try to figure out, well, why is it true? Why, how does it hold up? And, you know, I, I was raised, you know, in a, I mean, my dad was an academic, you know, and, you know, it, it doesn't take long to realize that the Christian faith is not considered, you know, the cutting edge in the, the world of academia. I mean, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's overwhelmingly materialist. Uh, science is widely touted as having disproven God, you know, and so you you face that sort of mindset and then you try to figure out, well, what's really going on? And so I started reading some of the creationist literature. That was really the only literature uh, available. And uh, I think, I, I, you know, I really enjoyed a fellow named A.E. Wilder Smith. I thought uh, he had some intuitions about information theory that I ended up running with. Uh, so that was good. And then there was also... Um, was it? Uh, there was a, um, a book 
uh, which had a little appendix in the back. It was about um, Close Encounters of a Third Kind was a movie that was very popular yeah, at the time. Yeah. And so uh, I, there was a book about it, challenging it, but then they had a little appendix on the probabilities or improbabilities of the origin of life. And I remember reading that and it's, it's something resonated in me. And it was at that time then that I started getting, doing a lot of mm. statistics just uh, I was in a, in a program, graduate program, uh, with where I just needed a lot of statistics. And so as I started thinking about these arguments, it just, uh, I thought the origin of life, that, that was just intractable for these sorts of materialistic scenarios. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once, you know, you distinguish between uh, the chemical evolution, how brute chemicals, inorganic, you know, lifeless chemicals can organize themselves into first life. And then evolution, normally we think of it as biological evolution. Once you've got first life, how can that process keep going and how can you evolve from some single cell uh, organism to us? Uh, but, you know, it, it just seemed to me that that whole story was you had just a huge gap at the origin of life, and yeah. uh, and I've never changed my view on that. I mean, everything okay. I know about the the processes there and the improbabilities tells me that uh, a naturalistic origin of life is is ain't going to happen. We have some folks joining us from Kentucky, Wisconsin, uh, Massachusetts. We're glad all of you are here. We're reflecting back on the intelligent design movement with William Dembski, and as we get going into this interview, we're going to take some live questions. So if you have some questions for him. Uh, write them down or add them here and then put them in at the end and we will uh, go to him directly on these. So looking back, what has surprised you most about what's happened over the past 25 to 30 years since the intelligent design movement started? Positive, negative? What's something you're looking back saying, I had no idea like to anticipate that heading into the work that you did? Ah, good, good question. Um, you know, I wish I could say that there was, you know, some, you know, sometimes in science, you talk about the critical experiment, something happens, and nothing is ever the same after that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, every the people's worldview shifts. And I think that's what I was hoping for with the intelligent design movement, you know, so that by the time I hit 65 retirement age, I'm now 60. I thought, you know, I, I thought we would have won the day. But uh, that hasn't happened. You know, I think uh, the arguments we have are better. But, you know, one, uh, one uh, thing I cite sometimes is there's uh, an old New Yorker cartoon where an attorney sits across from his client and he tells the, the client, you have a very good case, Mr. Pitkin. Uh, now, how much justice can you afford? You know, and I think that's, <laughs> that's it. You know, we've got the case. You know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think we've, I think we've shown in many levels, experimentally and also theoretically, uh, that uh, natural selection can't bear the burden that's put on it, nor can any other supplements to it, such as Evo Devo, evolutionary developmental uh, approaches to evolution. Uh, so I think we've got the better case, but getting that out there uh, and getting it accepted and getting the sort of critical mass of people, because I mean, scientific movements require talent. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's much easier to go along with the flow and, uh, you know, go with the, the standard evolutionary theory. And then you can really do a lot of word substitutions where you can say evolution did this when clearly there's some sort of design involved. But, uh, you know, so. Back to your question, you know, I think for me, there's been a big disappointment that the, this movement hasn't been as successful as I think it might have been. Um, that said, you know, I think a, a lot of that is because my, my vision is focused on the U.S. It does seem that we have made some inroads internationally. So I was okay. at a meeting last year uh, and it seemed that in places in Europe, uh, Brazil, it seems this, these ideas are exploding. So, uh, so they're they're positive signs. But uh, I think for me, uh, you know, I think one of the reasons I've got I've, I've semi-retired, let's say, from intelligent design, okay. is that uh, it seemed to me that a lot of the play where we missed it 
the reason we weren't as successful as we might have been is that we have an educational system that just does not train people to think, to reason. It doesn't make them courageous in standing up for truth. I think we've, you know, the whole tenure system, I think, is a way of enfeebling the academy, uh, making them go along with the party line. And so I think they're, so I'm, you know, so I focused on what I think of as, as it were, getting to the the root of some of the problems, or maybe another analogy would be doing an end run around the system and trying to deal with some educational issues that will okay. then make intelligent design okay. prosper. Now, originally, the, much of the discussion was about the power of naturalism, not so much the educational system. Um, how has that shift come about that you started to recognize, oh, it's the educational system, and does that downplay the role of naturalism, or is it still both in your mind? Well, I mean, I think the educational system, you've also got uh, uh, much more of a uh, relativist, postmodern, social constructivist view, which is very much out there. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, if to, you know, it's not that I sat back and thought, you know, the real problem is education. That's where I need to focus. I mean, the, my odyssey took much more of this form. I was, you know, let me just be blunt. I was teaching at Southern Baptist seminaries. Um, I was an old earth creationist. The, it seemed that the Southern Baptists were making a savage lurch to a, uh, you know, canst thou be more uh, right wing and literalist than me uh, approach to things. So I mean, it was just, uh, and I, I found myself being the odd man out. I found Ken Ham going around and berating me in the seminary for having hired me and basically trying to get me fired. Mm. And it was at that point that something shifted in me because on the one hand, I had been persona non grata at Baylor for being you know, being out there with intelligent design. And now, you know, the, the conservatives were no longer happy with me. And so basically I approached a former uh, research assistant of mine who had become a millionaire doing working in educational technologies and I asked, how'd you do it? What'd you do? And he showed me and then I did it myself. So, uh, so I got into education more as a matter of survival and my own sanity because, uh, you know, it was, it was deeply disappointing dealing with, uh, you know, getting it, as it were, from both sides. And so hmm. that, though, got me thinking, once I got into these educational technologies, is there a way to try to revivify intelligent design and try to strengthen the hand of it? You know, I mean, often uh, common criticism is what would an intelligent design curriculum look like? You know, so these right. are sorts of questions that I've, I've also considered. We have some folks from Brazil, from the Philippines, um, gosh, from Perth, Australia, join in here. And there's some great questions wow. coming in. Let me ask you a little bit of a, a practical one here. Uh, Andrew Green says, should theistic believers seek to prepare themselves to become qualified educators in order to try to develop or introduce curricula for teaching the controversy? Yeah, you know, when I hear educators, you know, it's, it seems to me, you know, my, my dad was, a, I mentioned that he was a biologist. He also had, I mean, he got had his PhD in biology. He also had a master's in education. I mean, he would often joke, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach, and then you could take that further. Those who can't teach, teach teachers. Those who can't <laughs> teach teachers, they get into administration and so on. You know, I mean, you just, you can keep running with that. But uh, there's a sense in which it seems, you know, I think we do ourselves better by actually gaining expertise in areas pertinent to intelligent design, to actually advancing the program. And there, there are different aspects to it. I mean, there, there are philosophical issues, methodological naturalism, something like Alvin Plantinga has done good work on that, William Lane Craig, Stephen Meyer at Discovery Institute. You know, there are theological issues. I have a master's of divinity, you know, and I've focused some of my work on the theology and people on the other side have used that, oh, that just means intelligent design is, uh, is a theological or religious endeavor. But, you know, from my vantage, you know, if somebody like Stephen Jay Gould can say, ever since Darwin, we know that we were not created in the image of a benevolent God, he's drawing theological or anti-theological implications from evolutionary theory. 
Likewise, it seems to me that there are theological implications to intelligent design, and so I've explored that. But at its base, intelligent design needs to be a scientific program, because if it's not that, then there, you know, then there's really nothing, nothing there. And this has been something we've we've stressed. You know, I think a problem with creationism historically has been this, this conflation of science and religion, and so often it's come across as a religion versus science controversy. And so at its base, I think we need to cash out intelligent design as a science versus science controversy. And so as far as we're successful with that, you know, I think we help ourselves. But, uh, you know, the, the other side doesn't want to allow that. You know, I mean, and so to this day, if you look at Wikipedia entries, um, yeah. uh, me or intelligent design or my colleagues, they make the editors make very sure that in the very first sentence, the word pseudoscience, uh, pseudoscientist, you know, discredited theory, creationism, you know, are all put there. Now, intelligent design is not a theory of creation. I mean, I think this is what, another thing that's got right. me into trouble with, um, you know, with my uh, Baptist friends, uh, because I think, uh, you know, they saw for a while intelligent design as this stalking horse that would be able to deal with the culture and then move forward the, the, the Baptist agenda. When that no longer seemed uh, possible, you know, I think they abandoned it. Mm. And so you have, I mean, Creation is about an infinite personal creator, God, who brings the world into existence out of nothing. You know, the uh, at least if you're a traditional Christian, uh, intelligent design is about fan finding patterns in nature that point to an intelligent source. Now, the ultimate source, you know, that intelligent source could be an alien intelligence. It could be a stoic divinity, a mind, you know, pervading you know, teleological principle, you know, or it can be the Christian God. Now, I'm a Christian, so for me, the ultimate source of the design in the world is the Christian God. And I, I say that without apology. But as a scientific and philosophical approach to understanding the world, intelligent design does not get you to Christian theism. Mm. Uh, and, you know, that's, uh, some regard that as a weakness. I regard it as a strength because you're defending less. You're not having to defend uh, literal 24-hour day Genesis account. You can still hold to that sure. and be an intelligent sign, sure. but you're you're not defending that as a matter of intelligent design. I, I've always thought there's some integrity built into the way you argue for intelligent design. You don't try to argue too much or try to argue too little. You try to say, here's what the science shows. And then beyond that, we're wading into philosophical and maybe historical in the case of Christianity and other kinds of questions that are not distinctly scientific. But I had uh, Stephen Myers on uh, recently, I had a chance to interview him, and he said the ID movement is kind of shifting from theory to doing practical hands-on science, and that it never mm -hmm. would really break through until there were some ID-directed scientific pursuits. Um, and I might have put it, I might have phrased that in a little way more me than him, but that was a general point he was making. You, you grew that as a whole, and do you see some of those scientific advances coming through that have been done in an ID-friendly fashion? You know, I'm, I'm seeing it, but more from a distance, so I can't speak to, okay. you know, the research that's actually going on. I mean, my, my day job is I'm working on websites, developing educational technologies, writing articles, you know, on... So it's uh, and 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 then doing books like a baseball biography, you know. So yeah. I've got lots of different interests, and so we might get to that at some point. Yeah. But um, but what I'm seeing though is, I mean, it does seem that there's movement. Uh, you know, I'm I'm still privy to what's going on at Discovery Institute. I'm on the board there. Uh, I'm a fellow with their Bradley Center. So I've, I, I you know I, I still have my ear to the ground. Uh, they are talking about Intelligent Design 3.0. This is, uh, you know, so it's this is the the program to really make it a full fledged scientific research program. I know they are supporting uh, people financially to do experimental work, and that seems to have been ramped up quite a bit. Uh, I know that had been an aspiration, but they're they're doing that. So, uh, so that's <coughs> all to the good, you know. Uh, you know, I think the, the issue always remains, can we get a critical mass? At what point uh, do we have some sort of breakthroughs where scientists say, okay, we can't even play act at a, a Darwinian 
naturalistic evolutionary story anymore. More, it's dead. You know, mm. uh, I think that's that's the point we need to get to. Uh, but uh, you know, so it's uh, I think we we need to keep pressing, and uh, it does seem that these ideas have gotten out there. You know, they still it seems people at least for public consumption, people in the mainstream academy who have not formally come on board with intelligent design still need to give the sense that, uh, hey, we're, we're still faithful to Darwin and these intelligent design people, they're nuts. You know, I think that's, that, that they have to say that, you know, otherwise, you know, this age of social media mobs, you know, you can get, uh, you know, get doxxed or whatever, you know, so you, you, you don't, you, so you, you know, you play it safe. And, um, but uh, it does seem that, you know, what people privately think, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more sympathy for what we're doing. But, you know, I don't, that's something I don't tend to see. You know, I'm, I'm not going to the conferences. I'm not rubbing shoulders so much anymore with people. So it's, uh, I look at this more from a distance. Bill, as you know, I think it was about four months ago, I hosted a great conversation with Josh Swamadas. And uh, with mm -hmm. Doug Axe, who's at Biola with me, and one of the topics that came up was whether or not you had abandoned the design filter or kind of backtracked on your approach to design. So my question is, during your time uh, since the beginning of the intelligence design movement, have you significantly changed your views, changed them in a small way, backed off your design filter, cleared the air for us, so to speak? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I actually responded to Josh Swamidas, uh, I think, in three installments uh, on my blog, and then that was picked up by Evolution News and Views at Discovery Institute. And the, the short of it is that I, I don't retract anything that I've, I've done. I mean, you know, there, there are okay. things, formulations that needed to be cleaned up that were not uh, entirely accurate. I mean, such as, for instance, there was a conditional independence condition in my book, The Design Inference, which ended up being unnecessary in characterizing this notion of specification. But with the explanatory filter, uh, you know, I, it, it seemed to me that this was from the start, it was, it was trying to get at this notion of specified complexity. So it was a user-friendly uh, you know, a, a rational reconstruction of what we tend to do as we sort through these various explanatory options that we have broadly necessity, chance, and design. And this chance can be not just flipping a coin, but where you've got something like a natural selection process. So it's chance and necessity working together. Uh, and so, you know, it still seems to me to work. There was one point in my writings where I said, well, I've largely dispensed with the filter because, you know, what it's really getting at is specified complexity. But uh, that doesn't mean I repudiate it, you know, and uh, I don't know. I mean, if I'm actually, I got the rights back to the design inference from Cambridge University Press. Uh, so I've, uh, I have a co-author, somebody who is really at the very cutting edge of all these uh, of, of where intelligent design is. And so we're, we're going to be doing a second edition. Right. I wanted to get that away from Cambridge because it uh, turned out that when, it, when I published it, it was the best-selling Cambridge philosophical monograph at the time, but they would not do the second edition. In fact, the editor there said, uh, even if you get it accepted at this side of the Atlantic, uh, there, there are biologists on the syndicate. Normally the syndicate in the UK just rubber stamps whatever the people in the US say, but they said he said in your case, they're probably not going to do it. So, uh, And that's what prompted me then to publish No Free Lunch with Roman and Littlefield. So really for 20, 25 years, I, I held off. Uh, yeah, it's, it was published in 1998, the design inference. So I held off. Uh, even wanting to do something because I thought, you know, I just don't want to do it with Cambridge. But now that I've got the rights back, uh, you know, I'd like to like to redo it. Now, when I redo it, you know, I'll probably put the filter in there just just out of spite, you know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, I mean, I, you know, I, that, that, that's not a good Christian sentiment. But you know, uh, it, you know, it's it's fine. You know, it it, it, okay. it it's limited in the sense that it, it gets at this specified complexity, and even specified complexity is characterized there is more this kind of statistical reasoning, but it's not an actual information theoretic quantity, and that's what it's become 
at the hands of Bob Marks, Winston Ewart, and others uh, as, as we've developed these ideas in terms of conservation of information. So, I mean, a lot has happened since the early days, you know, since some of this original work of mine. And so it's, it's I think, been made much more rigorous and powerful uh, with information theoretic tools. And so we have those now at our disposal, and I want to get that into the second edition as well. We're going to jump back to intelligent design stuff, but I have more of a, it's a personal question for you. I've never asked you. Is you obviously two PhDs done the hard working behind intelligent design, brilliant. But in writing the book together and the way times we've interacted, I think you're you're a very gracious and kind person, even though you're a bulldog fighting for ideas. How have you maintained just? what I think is a gentle spirit amidst some of the vitriolic attacks you've received from inside and outside the church. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe you're being too generous. I mean, you know, if you talk to my wife, certainly the first 10 years, I think you'd say that, uh, that I didn't keep that calm demeanor, hmm. uh, you know, and it's, uh, frankly, it's, uh, it was, it was tough on the family. You know, I was, I was an angry man for, for a lot of the time. Um, you know, and it was, uh, I think there was something in me. It's like, I'll show them, I'll show them. And, you know, the thing is when you deal with large institutions, institutionalized ways of thinking, uh, they they can wear you down, you know. So I think that yeah. happened to some degree, and so I had to just get realistic about, you know, what I was facing, how I was facing it, what wasn't working. Uh, I think another thing that uh, took some real, um, you know, some of the hard edges off was having a severely autistic son. To this day, he's nonverbal, needs to be washed, cleaned, you know, all this. So he's now just moved into a community. This is why we're back in Texas. And that's been a good good thing for him. You know, he's, he's a happy, happy kid. Uh, he's going to be 20 this week, but wow. um, he's a twin. His brother is perfectly normal, and we've got a daughter who's also normal. But, uh, you know, so that's, the, you know, just dealing with that. You know, it's, uh, I mean, you know, for years, my wife and I couldn't go to church together. It would be she would go or he, you know, or I would wow. go, you know, and it was uh, somebody always had to be with him. Now I can take naps in the afternoon, you know, but it was often just couldn't, you know, you'd have to watch him because otherwise he can get into trouble, you know. Mm. So, so uh, you know, I don't mean to say this is, you know, pity party or so, you know, I think uh, we've, we, we deal with what we're given, but it, it does shape us, you know, and so I think Fair. that has, uh, you know, put things in perspective, you know, so you get into some sort of, you know, argument with, you know, with an ID critic, you know, and then you put it in perspective there, and it's like, what does that really mean, you know, and then you, mm. I think you just choose your battles more carefully and, you know, I mean, there's there's a lot in, I think, the, the pastoral epistles about, you know, by Paul, you know, about the sorts of arguments and just not not getting into these sorts of shouting matches and uh, discussions about things that really don't mean a whole lot. And I don't mean to just say that intelligence design doesn't mean a lot. I think it does. I think for some people, you know, uh, you know, I think we'd be in much better shape in this culture if we thought that there was a design behind the world, behind the human body, that there was was a, a natural good for us. You know, there, there are things that are conducive to our benefit that we should practice those. You know, uh, but um, you know, the idea of virtue, you know, being yeah. a good thing. Uh, you know, I think that that would all be that all I think follows in some ways from you know, at least, you know, from intelligent design broadly construed. But um, anyway, so that, that's, I'm not sure that's a direct or that's you know, fair. Kind of a meandering yeah. answer, but it's, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, that probably says it, you know, and just, I think also, you know, I think it was, it was one thing when, you know, I was facing the naturalists, the theological liberals, if you will, but uh, I felt secure in my uh, conservative Christian base. But when that unraveled for me, I think something did turn there. And I just said, you know, I, I got to get out of this for my own sanity. And then I think that caused me to rethink a lot of where I am and what, what I'm doing and really okay. strive to, you know, 
just to put a lot of the anger aside. And even that, I mean, that that's much more recent thing. You know, I, I, anger has been an issue for me over the years. It's mm. uh, hasn't gotten me into too much trouble, but I came to the point where I, I just really had to had to clamp down on it. Mm. And so it's uh, you know, so uh, so yeah, things are better. Life well, is better. Good. Thanks. Thanks for your honesty. Here's more of a, a ID related question. Uh, from Worldview Detective, he says, if ID were false, how could you disprove it? What would an undesigned universe look like? Yeah, I mean, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, at some level, you can't disprove design. I mean, something that looks completely random could still have been carefully situated as such, you know, but uh, but I think the, the issue with intelligent design is always detectability. So can you detect the design that's there? So I don't know. I mean, in a world where you've got all sorts of um, uh, self-organizational processes that give rise to living things, you know, uh, would that be a world where intelligent design doesn't play a role? I mean, you know, I think, I mean, this is, uh, there was uh what was it? The Water Babies. Uh, there was a contemporary of Darwin's who who thought that Darwin had really given us a good idea, and that basically he gave us a world in which creatures were creating themselves. Okay, so there was this uh, sort of uh, self creation going on. Uh, so maybe, I mean, but even that I think would be remarkable. You know, if uh, if natural selection actually, you know. I mean, you know, back in the 60s, the thought was, you know, Darwinian evolution proceeds so slowly in biology. So if we can put it into a computer and get the computer to give us, you know, and evolve things, you know, then we can get some proof of it. Now, the thing is, evolutionary computing doesn't seem, hasn't really produced anything that fantastic, except insofar as we've put the design in there already in terms of objective functions. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge that has to go in there for this to work. But, you know, I mean, is there a possible world in which self-organization and evolutionary computing, you know, you, 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 you run an evolutionary computing algorithm and you get a conscious intelligence out of it? You know, uh, what is it, you know, uh, Avengers Endgame, who's, you know, or the, uh, you know, the, you know or who's, it's the, the, the artificial intelligence that's helping Iron Man, the name escapes me, you know, Jarvis, that's it. You know, we get a oh, yeah. Jarvis out of it. I don't know. I mean, you know, but but it's uh, I do wonder if that's even possible because, I mean, you know, for, for my vantage, uh, you know, com- consciousness is not computation. I don't think there's any evidence that consciousness is computation, you know. So, I mean, the sorts of Terminator themes, all of this, you know, it's, you know, it makes for great science fiction. But in the end, I would say it's fiction. So. So I don't know. I mean, it's uh, design in some broad sense where God with purpose creates the world, you know, or some designer creates the, brings it into existence, organizes it. I mean, because design is always about organization, but where the, that, the pattern that allows design to be detected is not evident. Um, uh you know, is that possible? I suppose, you know, but it's, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hypothetical that I don't think we really have to deal with. I mean, I think, mm. you know, one, one thing that I have seen over and over again is as we learn more biology, the complexities get greater and, uh, you know, the sorts of things we need to explain uh, seem to require more engineering feats and seem to be further and further beyond the remit of uh, natural selection and naturalistic processes. So, uh, so you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not getting the sense, I mean, you know, I think often there's this sense that the scientific community wants to give that science is this juggernaut and place for faith is constantly being shrunk, you know? But if anything, I'd say as knowledge increases, the place for uh, Darwinian evolution to be successful is shrinking. Okay, so. Okay. I'm, I'm really, there's a bunch of questions in here and I'm, I'm going back and forth between some of these, trying to honor some of the questions. Um, here, okay, here's one. Let's ask this. Uh, in, in all honesty, and this, I guess this question is for me, but I want you to weigh in on it. 
you think most scientists reject ID because of social political reasons, or is it really an issue of trying to make ID convincing? I guess at the heart of the question is, why do you think ID is re has been rejected by a large number of scientists? Is it philosophically based? Is it the educational system? What's at the heart of it from your, your perspective? At the heart of it is, I would say, ignorance. There's no incentive for them to really even engage the arguments. I think most, most scientists have not done that. I remember uh, in, in debating, what was his name? I, for, the first name escapes me. It was at, at Princeton. He was a bioethicist, uh, Silver. Okay. No, not Peter Singer. So, I mean, but a friend of his, I think Silver or Silver. And uh, he was making just some totally unsubstantiated claims that basically at Harvard they'd resolve the origin of life problem. I mean, he was just trying to bamboozle the audience. Uh, but, uh, you know, he had, it was clear that he hadn't read any of my stuff. And it was just, it was not necessary, right? Because he knew I had to be an idiot for holding the views that I do. So, you know, and I, I've, I've seen that mentality where it's just, we, we, we don't need to read your stuff. We don't need to engage it because we know that you've got nothing on the ball, you know? So I think that's that's a large part of it. Mm. And in fact, there's there's perhaps even a danger if we engage your stuff too much, if we, if we read it, you know, then, uh, you know, then our, our associates might think that we've been infected with your ways of thinking. So I think that's a large part of it. I think there's just uh, vast ignorance. Uh, now, among those who've engaged the material, I think some, you know, I, I think they're, they're doctrinaire materialists. And so it can't be true. You know, there's got to be some sort of uh, alternative naturalistic explanation. You see this, the same sort of mentality with miracles. Um, Anatole France, uh, a, a skeptic, uh, about 100 years ago, he visited Lourdes, uh, you know, and saw all these crutches where uh, people had, which people had left behind because uh, they had been healed of a, a limp or whatever. Uh, and then he had po the question is posed, well, why don't we see any wooden legs there? But then he says, you know, even if we saw wooden legs, like that would be an amputation that suddenly, you know, the leg has grown back. Uh, he says, uh, in that case, there'd still be a naturalistic explanation. It's just like with crabs or other organisms which can regrow a limb. You know, it, it, there, there had to be a, a natural way that this could have happened. It's just we haven't figured it out yet. You know, and ditto for evolutionary theory. I mean, if you're if you're a doctrinaire materialist, there is no evidence that need convince you. Uh, you know, now you can flip it around. You know, if you're a doctrinaire, you know, theist, you know, are you going to remain committed to intelligent design. But the thing is, intelligent design is not required for the faith. So, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. you've got something like a Josh Swami does who, who rejects it. So, um, you know, so it's, uh, so I don't think there's there's a, a parody there. But, um, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's interesting how this, this whole debate unfolds mm -hmm. and some of the, the, the motions in it, you know, which pull us in different directions. It's interesting you mentioned the incent the lack of incentive and the disincentive on the educational side are some of the things that you're now focused on because some of those are some of the barriers preventing people from even engaging these arguments. Um, let me ask you this. One of the things that changed in my time in this discussion is the kind of the a, a greater rise of theistic evolution known as evolutionary creation. I'm curious mm -hmm. as a whole what you make of this. And one of the shifts that I've seen is back the time when we wrote our book together in 2008, it felt like a lot of the key voices in theistic evolution were saying, we don't need a historic fall. We don't need a historical atom. Like they were willing to say, science tells us we must give up certain theological beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge red flag for me. Now there's quite a few sure. saying, you know what? We can have a historical fall. We can have a historical atom and coming up with some creative ways to wed evolutionary theory with historic Christian doctrine. Is that welcome to you as a part of the conversation? Does that concern you? Tell me your thoughts as you look on kind of the rise of that movement. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I wrote a book called The End of Christianity, and it was the, the idea was to, you know, it was supposed to be 
in counterpoint to some of the atheists that were writing at the time, God Delusion, End of Faith, Sam Harris, and, and others. So they, uh, so we, we had, uh, you know, so, and in that book, The End of Christianity, I raised the possibility that, you know, if you don't, uh, that one way, because I, I basically I take a retrodictive view of the fall, that the fall happens in space time, but that it affects history going backwards. So it's kind of a backward causation. It's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's speculative theology. I mean, it's trying to make sense of what, how, how can you keep natural evil as a consequence of the fall, basically of moral evil. And uh, so I speculate in there also that if you don't, if, if you've got evolution, you could use evolution as a story to get to Adam and Eve. And then basically Adam and Eve are put into this perfect situation, the garden, and then they sin, you know, and so you can, you can tell an evolutionary story. So I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's a way of making sense of things, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, is it, can you maintain Christian orthodoxy? Uh, I'd say broadly, you know, I mean, I think the, okay. you know, the, 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 there's a question of, you know, does Christian orthodoxy commit you to six 24 hour days, you know, in the creation, you know, how much latitude do you allow yourself? The reason I don't go there, though, is that I'm not an evolutionist. I, I just don't think the ev evidence supports large scale, you know, dramatic changes in biology by some sort of, you know, gradual evolutionary process, especially when you start going to these higher taxonomic levels, certainly phyla, but orders, classes, things like that. When you're lower level species, genus, you know, I could see a fair amount of evolutionary change there, but I, I just don't see the evidence. You know, I, I look at the Cambrian explosion, I look at what's what's there, and that's, you know, look, I, in, in some ways, you know, I could be an intelligent design guy and an evolutionist, not a Darwinian evolutionist, right. I mean, that might be right. he takes that view, and I think I, you know, would have made life easier for me in some ways. But uh, for me, it's it's just, I just don't see the evidence for it. And, you know, and it's not enough. I mean, my temperament is not such, well, this theory is just so too beautiful not to be true. You know, well, if the evidence isn't there, you know, I don't really care about how appealing it is. You know, I'm, it, it doesn't persuade me, you know. And so I see discontinuities in the fossil record. I don't see them being bridged. You know, I don't think it's that there's an absence of transitional fossil forms. It's just, you know, it seems to me that the fossil record is pretty good when you do statistical analyses of how much of the fossil record is preserved. It seems to be quite extensive, especially at higher taxonomic levels. And it's, uh, you know, so I, I, I just, I just don't think it happened, you know, and that's, uh, so that, that's why I don't go there. But I think it is an option, and I think you can. But I, you know, I do think if you're going to be theologically orthodox, uh, you you do need a historical Adam and Eve, and you need natural evil in some ways as a consequence of moral evil. So it's the fall of Adam and Eve is responsible for natural evil. It's not that, you know, as Carl Guyberson would put it. This is in line with what you were saying, where the, yeah. the state of the art yeah. was in the 2000 up to 2008 that uh, basically evolution is a selfish process, so it's it, it's going to lead to selfish beings. So it's that the problem is already inherent in nature and in the evolutionary process, and that's why we get to where we are and have the problems we do. It seems to me that that's, that's totally incompatible with Christian faith. I mean, at that point, you know, there's, there's no place for redemption uh, because, I mean, basically we've you know, God has conditioned us to be that way. It's not that we've consciously rebelled against God. And it seems to me that sort of, it's in the rebellion that our sin is found and where our redemption must lie as well. So you've written a number of very uh, influential and academic books on intelligent design. Knowing what you know now, if you went back to kind of the beginning of the movement, and my introduction, as far as I remember, to the Intelligent Design Movement was the Unlocking the Mystery of Life DVD, which mm -hmm. must be a couple decades old or so by now. You and Myers yeah. and Behe. And I was fascinated by the movement. And at that point, it was really some of the ideas were being formulated. If you went back that couple decades, knowing kind of the arguments and life experience that you have now, 
what would you do differently? <laughs> oh, I don't know. These these hypotheticals are really hard to deal with. Um, okay. You know, you know. I think there was one of the things that hurt us the most was this Dover v. Kitzmiller case. You know, and I think just, uh, you know, I ended up being even an expert witness in it. You know, I, uh, you know, it was the, 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 the economist Schumpeter uh, when he was uh, making an analogy here, when he was asked, why are you helping the uh, Austrian government uh, because they're socialists? And he says, if a patient is going to commit suicide, at least let a doctor be there with him. You know, and so I think that was my my attitude, you know, help help the uh, Thomas More Law Center, you know, uh, you know, help them through as they commit suicide. But uh, you know, I think I think we should have been much more forceful not to not to to help there and to get that okay. case off the off the books. But uh, you know, but I don't want to say that you know that was that was the turning point. But there were. You know, I think uh, I think another thing, though, was I mean, the, the sort of conflation between maybe this this will probably speak to your question. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of thinking on my feet here, uh, but I think the conflation of the cultural agenda implications of intelligent design versus the scientific program gotcha. and Discovery Institute, I think you know, was involved with both. I mean, you know, their, their Center for Science and Culture is, um, you know, is, is where the intelligent design work gets done. I was a fellow there for many years. Uh, you know, it was originally called the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture, you know, and it's when you bring those two together and there's reason to bring them together. How do you get the science funded when the NSF is National Science Foundation, NIH and all these Funding agencies think you're crazy, you know, well, you're going to have to raise money, but how do you do it? You know, please give us money for pure scientific research that's going to help the Christian faith or, you know, <laughs> we're going to we're going to help, you know, we're going to get intelligence design taught in the schools. You know, we're going to do these these politically and uh, culturally and legally incorrect things to advance these ideas. And we're going to also get the science moving forward. And I think that conflation uh, ended up hurting us because I think a lot of scientists who might have been more inclined to, to go with us, maybe, you know, uh, were look, seeing this also as a political movement and then I think shying away from it. So I think that was another thing. So maybe, you know, that and then Kitzmiller, I think that, that takes, that's still pretty early in the whole deal, I mean, at least, or the first 15 years. That, that's interesting. To, in some ways, it almost gave cover to the critics who said this is religiously motivated creationism, even though I don't think that was ultimately true yeah. and a fair critique of ID. Maybe it gave yeah. some credence in their mind to help dismiss it. Uh, because of that. That's that's an interesting thought. Well, you know, you consider how much money has been given to Intelligent Design Discovery Institute from its inception. You know, I think 1996 is when I would say that's when the, the ID program there begins. So that's 25 years, roughly. Uh, you know, I would say the money they've seen is probably a fraction of what the Noah's Ark exhibit has gotten or the, the Creation Museum, you know, outside Cincinnati. I mean, you know, it's it's, you know, and, and again, you know, how do you how do you raise money for this? How do you support the science? Uh if you're not getting the money from the NSF and other, I mean, you know, the thing is that, you know, it's not just that. I mean, I know uh, one extremely bright scientist who is getting money from Discovery uh, at a very fine school. And uh, he is, I mean, he told me in person that he's not in the National Academy of Sciences because he signed this dissent from Darwin post, you know, wow. so two guys that basically said, you know, no, you're, you're not making it. And uh, I think, now he's had uh, trouble getting funding, whereas it had never been a problem from the government organization. So he's having to get it through discovery, you know. So it's uh, there's, you know, there, you know, talk about cancel culture. I mean, all all the sorts of things I'm seeing where people are just outraged and surprised these days. I've seen this for 20, 25 years, mm. you know. I man, 
that's that's rough stuff. So l- let me ask it this way: since we're here, what advice would you give to younger scientists who want to do ID research today, in light of our cancel culture? Yeah, well, I mean, I would say get into the best schools you possibly can. Work extremely hard. I mean, strive to be excellent at what you do, and uh, keep a low profile. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, try not to compromise yourself. I mean, that's that's difficult, you know, because let's say you get your PhD, your junior faculty, and now you're asked to vote, you know, on some incoming faculty, you know, and it might be somebody who's an ID person, you know, and then it's like, uh, you know, what, what do you do? Do you vote against because, you know, the... The, the people there are saying, hey, you know, we, we've got to keep uh, got to keep these crazies out. Uh, so at what point do you blow your cover and you come out of the closet? Uh, I think that's that requires discretion, wisdom, practical wisdom. Hmm. But, uh, you know, but I think uh, if you want to contribute to the field, you're going to need to become expert in an aspect that's relevant. Uh, and then, um, you know, Put your head, hand to the plow, but also realize uh, it's it's going to be tough because we don't. I, I think we still don't have that critical mass. It's not like you know. I mean, the the ideal thing is you know. I I, I thought to myself, I'd someday you know, I'd, I'd come to the place where I could be part of a department and you know just have a set of colleagues where we can talk about these ideas. Uh, but that never happened. I mean, it's, mm. uh, you know, it was it was always there. There was always friction, always tension about these things. You know, they, uh, you know, so it's, uh, you know, to to get to that critical mass. It's happened in some controversial fields. Like, you know, you've got George Mason, Mason University. You've got a free market uh, Austrian school of economics that that is well represented there. And, you know, and so that and that's happened on, on in, in some economics programs. But intelligent design, it, it's still a very much a minority and isolated view. You have, you know, you don't even have so much pockets from what I can see in the U.S. as individuals at various campuses who are working in the area, sympathetic, but have to keep their head down. And mm-hmm. so uh, you better be prepared, uh, you know, to have some lonely moments, try to keep in touch with wow. uh, people uh, by Zoom or whatever, you know, preferably heavily encrypted, you know, and uh, <laughs> you know, just uh, and press press ahead. Hmm. I might have you squeeze a little bit towards the middle of the camera there, if you don't mind. Perfect. There we yep. go. Well, I know there's a lot of people that want to know what you're up to today, and you sent me a link to this book that you're writing <laughs> that just fascinated me. I was like, wow. Bill Dembski's written a book on the fastest pitcher ever. So <laughs> hold up the book just so people can see. I think you maybe have a copy right there. And tell yeah. us, it's called Dalco. What is the story behind this book? Yeah. Well, uh, Dalco is Steve Dalkowski. He was born in 1939, died this year of COVID. Uh, oh, he had wow. been suffering from dementia, alcohol-induced dementia for many years. But uh in 1957, he was 18, and all the major leagues clubs, there were 16 at the time, uh, eight in the American League, eight in the National League, were, were looking intently at him, and uh, he, Baltimore snapped him up. Uh, he was unexceptional in his physical look. I mean, he was 5'11", 170 pounds. Nothing about him would have got, gotten you to think that he had this amazing um, fastball, but even from uh, as an eighth grader, his dad could no longer really catch him because he was so fast, and he was hearing the ball actually buzzing. And this was just a, a phenomenon that you know, when people you know in his high school days were uh, watching him, they they not, not only was the ball moving extremely fast, but uh, there was this buzzing sound. Um, and so he had some phenomenal successes. Like in high school, he pitched back to the back no hitters with 20 plus strikeouts. But then the the reason he remained in minor league ball all his career was that he was exceptionally wild also. He had about the same number of walks as strikeouts. And so he could, you know, he could have 18 strikeouts and still lose eight to three, you know. And this was, this was continuing Mm -hmm. first six years in minor league ball. And then it was finally in 1963 that he seemed to get a handle on it. 
And uh, he was pitching against the Yankees. He struck out Roger Maris. I think he struck out perhaps even the side there. I mean, he was doing very well, seemed to have gotten his control issues in hand, and then he blew out his elbow. I mean, we don't know. It was probably UCL tear. And um, um, uh, and then after that, he never seemed to quite recover his speed. And, uh, you know, but uh, it's it's a remarkable story. Um you know, it's tragic, and yet, uh, you know, pe- people who saw him pitch, uh, they're estimating, I mean, Cal Ripken Sr. caught him, uh, thinks that he was hitting 115 miles an hour. Uh, you know, the, the very fastest that anybody's been clocked, and it's indirectly, it was wow. Nolan Ryan in, I think, the early 70s. Right now, we can't we get the speed basically from the release point, but they got it close to the close to the bag and then had to extrapolate back. And so with Nolan Ryan, they think 108, but uh, Cal Ripken, as I said, thinks it was, he was getting up to 115. Our thesis is that he had to get at least 110 if he was going to be better than uh, Bob Feller or Nolan Ryan. Okay. thing is, son Sam McDowell, who's considered the possibly the fastest MLB pitcher, uh, not MILB, minor league, but MLB, of the 60s, uh, wrote the foreword, and he saw uh, Dalco doing his side work uh, in the minors in 1961, and he said uh, the guy was just amazing, and it was just incredible, the speed that he had, and he says he's convinced Dalco threw a lot harder than he did, and people who've seen Feller, Ryan, others say Dalco was faster and some a lot faster. So it's uh, it's a, it's a fascinating story. I got on this, you know, uh, just to have an interest in pitching. I have a son who 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 pitches and um, uh, so it's it's been an interest of mine and so I was looking for some Dalco memorabilia and that's when I got in touch with a pitching coach who's also a world-class photographer has done uh, photography for National Geographic and New York Times. And so we just hit it off and we said, hey, the story has not been told. It's perhaps the great last great untold story. And then we <laughs> got a third author and we, we wrote it. And so we're actually up for a Casey Award, which is the big baseball wow. book wow. award. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to be decided, I think, uh, in the next month or so. So fingers crossed, you know, if we can, you know, we might get it. But uh, anyway, it was a fun book. Uh, took a lot of work, a lot of archival work, you know, just going through old newspaper archives, uh, trying to piece together. Also, there's so much mythology that's about around him wow. and just wow. teasing that apart from what was real. So anyway, it's a fascinating story. I, I hope it le- eventually leads to a screenplay because I think it would be it could could be a great great story there. And by the way, um, Nuke Lelouch in the movie Bull Durham. Dalco was the inspiration for Nuke Lelouch mm. in that in that film. So if you've seen that, you already you have some connection with Dalkowski. Well, hold it up one more time, Dalco, just so people can can see. Yep. It sounds like an absolutely fascinating book. Uh, it does not yep. look like what you would think a picture would look like to throw 110. <laughs> That's basically uh, a bit, my a bit size. of a break from intelligent design. Yeah, a fun break. Well, tell us. We're going to wrap up because I want to respect your time. But is there anything else yep. you are up to right now that you just want folks to know that you're doing? Yeah, um, you know, I've thought about this uh, because I, I try not to say too much about what I do in educational technologies, but. Um, there is a website that people might be interested in, which is doing academic rankings uh, differently. Uh, and I think the, and they're using some technology that I helped develop. So it's, it's called academicinfluence.com. So academicinfluence.com, uh, you know, check it out. I mean, it's basically the idea is you look at people in terms of their academic influence, and from there you use that to induce rankings of uh, schools and disciplinary programs. And so it's uh, a very rich site. Uh, I think if you start using some of the tools, I think you'll be fascinated with it. And so I've, uh, I can say that I've had some role in uh, creating those tools. That, that is fascinating. You are a rare scholar who also has this entrepreneurial side about you. <laughs> so I'm always fascinated to hear what you're up to, what book you're writing, what site you're developing. Uh, doing doing great work. Uh, personally, and Biola, we really appreciate the work that you're doing. Maybe someday we can get you on campus 
to teach a class because you know we have an apologetics program, but also a master's in science and religion. And your friends, Paul Nelson and Stephen Myers and John Bloom regularly teach that program. So maybe someday I'll be pulling you to come out and do a weekend. Well, class. Well, let me, let me just say this. My, my son, Will, who's the pitcher, he's, he goes to Caltech. So uh, oh. I have reason to come out your way. Okay. So I once will... COVID is finally done. Oh. I will pass that on to the powers that be. That would be, we would love to host you. That'd be a, a treat Good. on so many levels. Um, I like let's that do as that. Well. I know Ma Megan is listening. She's hosting this for us. Take a note. Uh, I see she said, thank you all for being here. <laughs> Take a note and let's contact Dr. Dembski and get him to teach a class in the future. Our students would absolutely love it. Those of you listening know that we have a master's program in apologetics top ranked it's now officially become i'm not sure if you heard this or not yet bill but it's officially completely online starting this spring wow. which is pretty awesome and we have the masters right. in science and religion where we study especially the issues that we've been talking about if you're not ready for a master's degree we have certificate program and if you look below in the notes we've got some uh discount code for you we will help work through some of these issues with you and don't forget to hit subscribe tomorrow uh, going to be talking with Michael Cohn and Gary Habermas, two of the leading uh, proponents and experts on the resurrection in the world. I know Mike is a co-author of yours, yeah. uh, Bill, and talking about a new book that is just coming out in a couple weeks. Really asking questions, where is the state of the evidence for the resurrection? Yeah. What are the best evidences? And some of the questions we asked tonight, how has this conversation changed over time? Well, I want to uh, let all of you go to honor your time. Hang on for just a minute, Bill. Don't Don't disappear yet, but thanks so much for tuning in. Hope everyone has a great, great evening.